Okay, so we have talked about time and place for observations. Let's talk about the specific about qualitative and quantitative observations. Well, what is an observation actually? An observation is acquiring information from a primary source. That can be humans, that can be scientific instruments. Let's talk about the differences between those two very briefly. For instance, from humans, you generally gather sensory information from hearing and seeing and smelling and feeling the weather phenomena. From scientific instruments, you generally gather measurements. You might do calculations from those measurements. But what I want to point out to you here is that humans do qualitative observations through their senses and the scientific instruments do measurements through their apparatus. An example, this is actually the Australian fires of January 2020 and the firestorm that was caused by that. And when you see this, it just gives you a gut reaction of so much forest and so much pollution due to those fires. And that gut reaction is a, is a really important part of qualitative measurements. So you can see that smoke plume. You can hear those trees falling when you're near that area. You can certainly smell the smoke and you can feel the heat of that area. In the same way for many daily meteorological observations, you can see cloud shapes, you can see cloud colors, you can feel humidity. So you can really make emotional attachments to your weather observations, your qualitative observations. And these were just really emotional, motivating, ties to a problem or to an observation that you make. Unfortunately, these are all kangaroos that died in the fires in Australia. Just really horrible stuff. Burned animals. Um, it really keeps you motivated to solve climate problems when you have these qualitative observations. Some of the pros of them are that you're motivated to solve those problems, but the cons are that you have a hard time comparing your observations to another person's observations because they're all subjective. So we really do need to use scientific instruments for that quantitative, that objective measure. And we might make calculations out of those measures. Um, for instance, you know, this goes back to data analysis when I do um, from those wildfires across Australia, we can make some calculations and we can gather all our data to be able to visualize those well. So we can try to make this quantitative unemotional data into something that looks more emotional because it's more visual. So that's a way that we can manipulate the data and analyze it. Let's talk about scientific observations and measures. Measures in meteorology can be things like visibility, quantities of precipitation, certainly temperature. Calculations in meteorology that are very important are cloud cover, wind speed, which is a calculation, humidity, which is a pretty complicated calculation, and air pressure. Air pressure is a calculated quali um, quantity. So um, let's discuss these more in depth. When it comes to visibility, really important point here. This is actually the scene from uh, the Kobe Bryant crash where visibility was the big problem in that fog. And visibility is obviously important for pilots, but also for drivers, for ship captains. Do you do it in metric or you do it in English? Well, there's a lot of confusion going back and forth between those two systems. Let's analyze it a bit more. The English system is more familiar to you. You know miles, you know feet, you know about how much that is. 
very tough to convert, especially converting feet to miles. 5,280 feet per mile? That's a really hard division to do. It's a really hard multiplication to do if you need to do it times 23 miles. How many feet is that? It's a tough thing to do. When it comes to metric, it's not as familiar to you, but it's all in multiples of 10. So you go back and forth with your, with your um, decimal point, and you can say that one kilometer is 1,000 meters. Just move the decimal point over. One kilometer, you might know, is about 11 football fields long. You know that a 5K is 3.1 miles. So um, this is the international standard, and you have to choose one or the other because there are problems with trying to use both of them in those conversion factors. But I'm going to advocate that metric is the way to go. Let's go on to another measure that's really important in meteorology, and that's precipitation. It's important for farmers. It's important for ski managers. It's important for drivers. Uh, precipitation is a volume measure. What is volume? Volume is different from area. Volume is the amount of 3D space that an object takes up. That object could be liquid. It could be gas. It could be solid. For instance, you may want the volume of a hailstone, right? You don't want to measure it in inches of length times width times height. It, you know, a hailstone is really irregular. By using fluid displacement, you could be able to say that the hailstone was 350 cc's. And that would give a much better representation than trying to measure the distance across an irregular hailstone. With the English, it's familiar to you as ounces. It's really hard to know what an ounce is. And in fact, we don't even measure rain in ounces. We measure rain in inches, which is a distance measurement rather than a volume measurement. These are very tough conversions. Much easier in metric. You either measure in cubic centimeters or you measure in liters or milliliters, but it's all with the decimal point because one liter is a thousand cubic centimeters. Just move the decimal points back and forth. One liter is about a quart, if you think about that. You know, the two liters is about a half gallon and it is the international standard. So in this representation here, you're seeing Mexico in here and you're seeing the southern United States and the rainfall totals that just came in from that tropical storm Cristobal, which went through just about three weeks ago. So um, the, rain the rainfall totals are measured in centimeters here, which I'd rather they were measured in cubic centimeters. But you see the confusion that happens as a result of some of these measurements. We are going to work on measuring really well so that you become really confident about your measures in meteorology. And another, temp another measure in meteorology, of course, is temperature. Well, what is temperature? Temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of a substance. That substance could be a liquid, that substance could be a gas, and that substance could be a solid. So temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. We actually measure it by comparing the expansion and contraction of a very specific liquid, usually mercury, could be other liquids, versus a scale. So when we're measuring mercury expansion in higher temperatures, the mercury moves up the scale. What is the scale? The scale could be Fahrenheit, and you are very familiar with Fahrenheit. It seems really familiar to you, but think about it. It's really complicated. Freezing, when all liquid is stops moving, is at 32 degrees. Boiling, when all liquid becomes vapor is at 212 degrees. 
why not just think about Celsius freezing when nothing moves in water is zero degrees Celsius. And boiling is 100 degrees Celsius. Again, you just move that decimal point back and forth. It's really a beautiful thing. And it's the international standard. We're going to go with Celsius for most things, but I will tell you, you will be confused because the United States insists on Fahrenheit for surface temperature measurement and anything above the surface is Celsius. It's crazy. So it's going to drive you a little bit nuts. We're going to talk about conversion factors between Fahrenheit and Celsius because we're going to need them. Um, we're going to talk about that in our uh, Zoom meeting and we're going to do a bit of that in your uh, short assignments, your small assignments. There are meteorological observations that are calculations and we'll do some of those as well. Um, cloud covers are a percent. 50% cloud coverage is actual cloud coverage divided by total cloud coverage times 100. So um, that makes sense to you, 50% cloud coverage. We might say 25% um, cloud coverage. You might say partly cloudy, mostly cloudy, but we're going to get into numbers and measurements more. Wind speed is actually a calculation because it is distance divided by time. You know that miles per hour, kilometers per hour. And wind speed and wind direction often go together. Wind direction is, you always know the wind direction from the direction where the wind or, um, originated. A southerly wind is going from south to north. A northwesterly wind is going from northwest to southeast. All right, we'll practice that as well. And humidity is just such a messy calculation that involves vapor and temperature and charts in percent, and we'll get into that later. Um, we'll make it very, we'll make it easier by moving to dew point instead. Um, Americans are hooked on humidity, but I'm going to move you over to dew point because it's going to make your life a lot easier. I want to show you that you're not the only one that's confused by metric versus English. This is a YouTube video. I'm going to bring it in over here, I hope, and you're going to be able to watch it. So give me a second to bring it in and we bring it over and turn it on. And hopefully you're going to be able to watch this. When NASA lost a spacecraft because it simultaneously used imperial and metric measurements on the same mission, the Mars Climate Orbiter disappeared 15 years ago this month, and here's a very brief recap of exactly what went wrong. The Mars Climate Orbiter launched on December 11, 1998 on a mission to orbit Mars. This first interplanetary weather satellite was designed to gather data on Mars' climate and also serve as a relay station for the Mars Polar Lander, a mission that launched a few weeks later. But you can't just launch a spacecraft towards Mars and trust that it's going to get where it's going. You have to monitor its progress. Many spacecraft have reaction wheels to keep them oriented properly and navigation teams behind interplanetary spacecraft that constantly monitor the angular momentum and adjust trajectory to make sure it gets exactly where it needs to go. In the case of the Mars Climate Orbiter, monitoring its trajectory and angular momentum involved a few steps. First, data from the spacecraft was transferred to the ground by telemetry. There, it was processed by a software program and stored in an angular momentum desaturation file. That processed data was what scientists used to adjust the trajectory, adjustments that were made by firing the spacecraft's thrusters. Every time the thrusters were fired, the resulting change in velocity was measured twice, once by a software program on the spacecraft and once by a software program off the ground. And here's where the problem comes in. It turned out that the two systems, the processing software on the spacecraft and the software on the ground, were using two different units of measurements. The software on the spacecraft measured impulse, or the changes by thrusters, in newton seconds, a commonly accepted metric unit of measurement. Well, the processing software on the ground used the imperial pound seconds. And it was unfortunately the ground computer's data that scientists used to update the spacecraft's trajectory. And because one pound of force is equal to 4.45 newtons, every adjustment was off by a factor of 4.45. 
For a spacecraft traveling tens of millions of miles to a destination, a number of seemingly small errors really add up. 